First one I got says, how does a member under church judgment, we'll use the word church discipline, return to the church body and the fellowship of the other members? That's a great question. So we talked about what happens when a person is in unrepentant sin and refuses to, to change that. Then one person goes, multiple people go, and they, they won't do it. The elders, the church, they just, no, I'm not going to do it. And so we have to remove them from the church. We can't even eat with that brother or sister. We have to literally, they're under the, they are under the judgment of the church. They're under church discipline. And the question is, well, what about when they do repent? How do they come back? And, and the answer is it's very simple and very complicated. The answer is they, they come back as soon as they're actually repentant. Once they repent, they're back like it never happened. But it has to be real repentance. It cannot be they say they're sorry, but nothing about their life bears the fruits of repentance right? A person would come back in humility. Now, I don't advocate this, but early, the early church, uh, hang on, I'm going to take a drink of water. Thank you. The early church, uh, look, we're talking first, second century type, let's say second century probably, when they would practice church discipline and a person got removed, when that person wanted to come back, what they would actually do is they would make them spend a certain number of weeks when the church would gather on a Sunday morning, they'd make them stay outside the church. They were not allowed to come in. They were repentant, but they showed their repentance by for several weeks being outside and not being able to go in and take communion and pray with the church and study the word with the church. They were outside basically, basically showing their humility to prove their, their repentance. Now, we're not going to have a line of people outside the church every week saying, you know, I'm showing my humility. That's not what we do. And I don't think, I don't think the Bible demanded that of them. For whatever reason, in their cultural context, they thought that was the right way to do it. But what they're really trying to do, the principle is, you want to see actual repentance. That means the person has turned from the things that they're doing. So if somebody, is, for instance, is, is under church system because they refuse to live a godly lifestyle and say their sex life. They, they refuse, they're, they, they're going to live with their boyfriend or girlfriend, they're not going to get married, or they're going to live in a homosexual relationship, or they're going to, whatever it is, right? They got a pornography addiction, they just keep doing it and whatever. And they say, I repent. Well, there's got to be some proof that they repented. If they're still living with the person they're not married to, they need to get married. That would show repentance, right? Uh, if they're, whatever it is that they're doing, you have to show that they've turned from a thing and that their heart is actually humble and repentant. And we don't, we don't judge at the heart where we actually say, well, I can see that your heart is or isn't. What we do is that you know them by the fruits. And so when somebody wants to come back into the church, as we, have, as we do see in the scripture, if you look, if you turn with me to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Let's go there. We will see. Sorry, let me get my glasses on. We'll see what's going on. And this, we remember, we had the person who was sleeping with his father's wife. Everybody knew about it, well known. Assumedly, they're showing up at church together, sitting next to each other. This guy's having relations with his father's wife. And unrepentantly, and Paul's like, get him out of the church. Remove it. Have nothing to do with the one who does that, calls himself a brother and does that kind of thing. But then we see in chapter 2 of 2 Corinthians, to start at the beginning, but I determined this within myself, that I would not come again to you in sorrow. For if I make you sorrowful, then who is he who makes me glad, but the one who is made sorrowful by me? And I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I came I should have sorrow over those from whom I ought to have joy, having confidence in you all, that my joy is the joy of all. So Paul's basically saying, look, I don't want to make you sorrowful, because you're the ones who give me joy. If you're sorrowful, I'm going to be sorrowful, we're all going to be sorrowful. So let's be joyful. I want to come to you in that, Right? For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. But if anyone has caused grief, now he's talking about, we believe, and commentators believe, the person he's talking about here is that guy who had been sleeping with his father's wife. Okay, so that's the anyone who has, who has caused grief. If anyone has caused grief, he has not grieved me, but all of you to some extent. Not to be too severe. This punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, inflicted by the church, is sufficient for such a man, so that on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. For this end I also wrote that I might put you to the test, whether you are obedient in all things. 
Now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Well, what are his devices? Well, he wants, like he does for you and like he does for me, he wants us to, to be overcome with shame. Satan loves it if you can be overcome with shame or overcome with fear. These things will lock you up. And so you have this person. He's clearly repentant. And Paul's saying, yeah, I know what he did was very serious and it damaged the body. Because you can't have that kind of lifestyle, unrepentant sin, and it doesn't damage the body. It does. So I know that. But he's repentant. And lest he be overcome with sorrow, with shamefulness, with all that kind of thing, bring him back in. Reaffirm your love to him. He's back. That's over. Let's, let's be in joy together. Because, we, because Paul's saying, this is a repentant person. So I forgive him in front of Christ. You forgive him and bring him back in. That is the goal. That is the goal of church discipline is to see that kind of reconciliation. And so if a person is truly repentant, they, they're right back. They're right back. And you'll know because there will be a humility about the person. I, you know, people talk about, um, how do I know? How do I know? All I can tell you is that if you've been, if you're truly in Christ and you've had that moment where you understand that you're a sinner in need of a savior and you know what that did to your heart, and the humility that it brought, and the fruit that it brought in your life of that kind of repentance, you know it when you see it in other people. And when you see something that sounds like repentance but doesn't look like that, you also know it's probably not repentance. And so if there's repentance and a turning from the sin, that's how we allow a person back in. Uh, Next one says, if a young couple living together gets married in order to repent and no longer be living in sin... Why would you talk about that? Oh, because I just said. But then as they get older and mature, they realize they weren't the right person to marry. Isn't that also a sin if they divorce? Which is worse? (laughs) Ah, a lesser of two evils. Um, So, okay. I'm going to take this one thing at a time. If young couple gets married in order to repent and no longer be living in sin, which, by the way, is not the only way to repent. You could stop having sex and not live together. Okay? It's, It's not like... We have to get married. If you're living in sin and you repent, repenting means stop doing the thing, which in this case is having sex. So yeah, you can get married if you want to keep having sex. I'm seeing how many times I can say sex in a sermon. (laughs) People are like, he's saying sex a lot. That's a lot of... God made it. Um, You can stop doing that. So, but let's assume that you said, no, no, we're going to go ahead and get married. Well, that's a decision you should make. It would also be wrong to get married if that is not what God's called you to and you're doing it in rebellion against him. So that's a problem. But if you got married because it was the right thing to do and you you, you believe the relationship should continue and you want to to make it holy, that's good. Then it says if you get older and you find that they weren't the right person to marry. Let me help you with that. There is no right person to marry. Which, Which person is the right person to marry? That sinner or this sinner or that sinner? They're all sinners, Okay. Um, The right person to marry theory is a bad theory. Um, In fact, for many, many, many years, you just married the person your parents chose for you to marry. Uh, And they weren't really as concerned about the right person to marry. They were concerned about how many cows that dude had, right? And things like that. Which I have none. And if we were still back then, I would not have been able to marry Tiffany. She would have gotten a lot of cows. Um, (laughs) She's a very special woman. So the right person to marry is, is, is a, I mean, it's true, you can marry somebody in sin, and that was not the person you were supposed to marry. I'll give you that. Um, and then you get a divorce because the marriage, let's just say the marriage doesn't work out and you get divorced. divorce. Is that sin also? It can be, yes. Which one is worse? That's not the way I would look at it. Uh, sin is sin, okay? So a divorce is sin if it's done without a biblical justification. There are certain, God hates divorce, but there are certain circumstances where there's justification for divorce. They're, they're in the Bible. They're pretty clear. Okay? Um, if you want me to go through them, I can go through a couple of them. Okay? One is sexual immorality. You have a husband or a wife who has violated the marriage bed. If that has happened, so when, when the husband or the wife has gone out and committed sexual immorality, you are allowed, you are, you are permitted to end that marriage. Okay? Um, the other would be if you marry a person and they will not live with you, okay? They're, they're an unbeliever, let's say. You're married to an unbeliever, you become a believer. 
You have an unbelieving husband or an unbelieving wife, and that person refuses to live with you because you're a full Christ follower, you are free of them. You do not have to stay in that marriage, okay? And, and I think you can extend that will not live with you to, to other issues. I would say will not live with you in safety, in peace. So if you're being physically abused, right? If, you're be, if your spouse is harming you, harming your children in, in those kinds of ways, I would say that person is not willing to live with you. It's like, well, I'm willing to live with you so long as you let me beat you up. That's not willing to live with you, okay? So there are some uh, issues where, where a marriage, may, a divorce may happen and be justified. What, what I would recommend is that you come to a, myself, one of the other elders, and talk through your situation if you think that a divorce needs to happen that's justified. If it's not, and you go, I've just fallen out of love, that's actually an issue for church discipline. If you go, I don't want to, you know, my wife and I, it's been a good run. It's been a good 20 years. Um, I saw a younger model and thought I might, you know, whatever. Let me just tell you, sin. Absolute gross sin. And if you do that and you leave your wife, you will be in church discipline. And if you persist and you actually do it, you will be removed from the church and outside, outside the protection of the church and the shield wall. If you leave your wife without biblical grounds to do so, you will be under church discipline. And if you leave your husband for the same reason. Now, if there really is a biblical reason for it, then you can do it. When I used to practice law, uh, when I used to practice family law, I still practice some law, but I don't practice family law anymore. Um, I would only do divorces in situations where there was a biblical justification and I was representing the one who had the justification. There wasn't, well, there's a biblical justification, but you're the adulterer, I'll take that. No, it was, it was the, the other way. Actually, my law partner and I, that's how we did it. And I think three different times we ended up having to re represent wives of pastors where the pastor had done something um, that they ought not to have done. It was very sad. Um, but, but I know at least once somebody got very upset when they called the law office and we said, what are the circumstances? And they said, essentially, we fell out of love and we said, we won't do that. We won't do that. You know, we're not going to help you do that divorce. And they got so mad. How dare you judge me? I'm not judging you. I'm just telling you what the Bible says, Right. And so that, that was an issue. But there are, uh, the, one of those sins is not worse than the other. What I would say is if you're living in a sinful relationship where you're sleeping with somebody who you're not married to, don't just marry them as an act of repentance. You can have an act of repentance by stopping sleeping with them too. Um, you should talk to, again, your, talk to your life group leader, talk to one of the elders, talk to one of the deacons, talk to one of the folks in this church who is caring for your soul about how you ought to handle that situation. Don't just jump into marriage as if marriage by itself would be the way to repent because it may not be the thing you're supposed to do. And then you won't have to worry about the marrying the wrong person divorce thing. Good question, though. You mentioned that those who practice homosexuality or those who are living together unmarried can come back to the church after repentance. Can you clarify? Are we kicking sinners out of church for these things? Uh, yeah. Yeah. If you are calling yourself a brother or sister in Christ and you're sleeping with someone, you're having sex with a person that you are not married to, yes, if you refuse to repent from that, we would remove you from the church. Um, and I'm, I'm not the one who said that. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's go back into the scripture so you can know it's not just I'm a meanie, but this is the way the Lord set up the church. Because it... In 2024, it sounds like, wow, that sounds really harsh. And so, okay, but we don't, we don't set our, our morality or our ecclesiology based on 2024 and how people feel these days. We base it on the scripture, which is forever. So let's get into 1 Corinthians chapter 5. There we go. All right. It starts at the beginning. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. Now, the first thing here is you've got to understand Corinth. Corinth, nasty. Corinth was so sexually perverse. So the fact that in the, like, but even they weren't sleeping with their father's wife. They were doing anything else you've heard of, they were doing it. And they'd make pictures of it on the walls and do all kinds. I mean, they were, they were so disgusting. But even they weren't sleeping with their father's wife, which is so messed up. But he, he goes down and he says um, that you must, you must remove 
the person who's doing this. But if we go to verse 9, it says, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Don't keep company. So he has written a, a letter to them before 1 Corinthians. We don't have that letter. It's not extant. It doesn't exist. We don't have um, copies of it. But we know at some point he wrote them a letter. And in it he said, don't keep company with sexually immoral people. But then he clarifies here. He says, yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. Now, here's the thing. If you're not a Christ follower and you're coming to church to, to learn about God, to learn about Jesus and whatever, but you're not, a Christ, you're not calling yourself a brother or a sister in Christ and you're in a homosexual relationship or you're in a relationship with your boyfriend or girlfriend, I don't care. It doesn't mean I, I don't think that it's wrong. It means right now my main focus is to get you saved. I'm first concerned with your salvation, that you would come to Jesus Christ and be saved. He will forgive all of that. Then we can work on what it looks like to have a lifestyle that's obeying all the commands that Jesus has met, that has put out there for us. So, so if you are in sin of that kind, and you're not calling yourself a brother or sister in Christ, no, there's no church discipline, because there is no church discipline for those who are outside. And there are some of those who are outside, who are inside on a Sunday morning, inside the building, but not yet inside the church right? There are people who are not saved yet. They're not calling themselves brothers and sisters in Christ. If you're calling yourself a brother or sister in Christ, what you're saying is, I'm subject to the scripture. And so he uses this term, sexual immorality, right? We see it all over in the Testament, the, the Greek word being porneia, which is this term for anything, anything other than sex between one man and one woman in the context of marriage committed for life, subject to those um, exceptions I talked about for when a divorce happens. That's the only context for sex. It starts in Genesis 2. Jesus repeats it again in the Gospels. Paul repeats it again here. There's just no question. There's one context where people say, well, Jesus never said anything about homosexuality. First of all, not true. But second of all, he gave us the only context for sexual morality. And the word porneia means everything else. You're looking at porn. You're sleeping with your neighbor. You're sleeping with somebody who's not, you're, you're, you're doing acts of homosexuality, you're doing whatever. Those are all porneia. They're all sexual immorality. Okay, there were a bunch more listed in Leviticus that the people of the, of the land of Canaan were doing, including dead people and animals and all this kind of crazy stuff that was going on. And this is what these people were, that's how they lived. The people that were driven out of the land of Canaan, they were just, they were vile. But all of this goes in the, the category of sexual immorality. Anything but one man, one woman married for life. If you think that the scripture does not apply to you in that, I promise you it does. And yes, if you call yourself a brother or a sister, we will remove you from the church eventually if you will not repent from that. First, we'll try to work with you, try to get you to see it. It starts and ends all in love. We're going to come to you and say, hey, here's what the scripture says. Can we agree that that's what the scripture says? If you say no, we're going to try a little harder. Maybe bring a couple more people. But eventually, if you continue to say no, either I don't believe that's what the scripture says, or I refuse to follow what the scripture says, then yes, you don't. There are rules in the house. There are rules for the church. There are rules for us. They bind me. They bind you. We're all sinners, but you can't unrepentantly rebel against God and be living with his children. So yes, we would remove somebody for that. How would we... Um, how would you come back into the church? Not the same as I said before. Repentance. Stop doing it. Repent. Recognize the calling of the Lord. So that may mean for you, if you're a person who has same-sex attraction, for instance, that may mean that you, you may end up having to live a celibate life. And I know in 2024, again, like, oh, but isn't sex the most important thing that's ever happened? No. No. If you're really good at it, it's something that takes a few minutes, you know, a couple times a week. It's not. <laughs> Welcome to Axe Church. It is not your life. Okay? There are people called to be celibate. Some of you are called to be single whether you're attracted to same sex or opposite sex or whatever. Some of you are just called to be single. Paul was. He actually thought it was a high calling. There are people just called to be single, either for a time or for their whole life. Doesn't, none of that is what matters. What matters is there's only one context where you can be having sex and call yourself a brother or sister in Christ. That is within the context of marriage, one man and one woman. And I know that, man, that sounds so old school. And haven't we evolved? No. We haven't evolved. And if you want to use the word 
uh, evolution to talk about bodies, which of course, uh, don't get me started, but um, you can look at your body and recognize we haven't evolved. There's one way this works. Properly. I'm going I'm to leave it there and tell you that God has commanded, designed, he has designed sexuality to work in one context. If you refuse to have your sexual life in that context, you are violating not just the scripture, you are violating the created order. Okay? The reason that Christians are so brokenhearted for the LGBTQ community, we love them, we desire them to find Jesus, is because their sin is a violation of the created order and causes... uh, it causes massive problems. Physically, spiritually, it just... Read Romans 1 and you'll see. I mean, it, it just causes destruction. And of course, the, the new kid on the block where transgenderism has become this huge thing, which it used to be like 0.0001% of people, and now it's like, you know, one out of every four teenagers is all of a sudden something other than what they actually are. This is, a, this is sick, demonic perversion. Okay? And it's not their fault, so that we're clear that they are tempted towards this thing. The world, is, the world is trying to push it on them. And what we need to understand is that we need to show them the grace and mercy of Christ and help draw them away from that because it is a violation of the created order. God made some of you women, and that is a beautiful, wonderful, glorious thing. And God made some of you men, and that is a beautiful, wonderful, glorious thing. One is not better than the other, and whatever you feel like, you can see what you are. And just be that unto the Lord. All right, let's keep going. Is there a difference between dealing with an elder and a regular attender? Great question. Great question. Let me look here for a second. Um, I think we're in 1 Timothy. Okay, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 5. We're going to start at verse 17. It says this, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor. That's talking about um, the elders who are, who are particular, like, like, the, like me, who I actually, this is, this is my full-time, like, this is my vocation, this is what I do. Double honor, talking about, frankly, getting paid. Um, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Do I like being called an ox? It's okay. (laughs) And the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses, which we talked about, that procedural law issue. We want to make sure that things are actually established by two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest also may fear. Then he says, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. Now, what what is that saying? Okay, there's there's two ways that the commentators have interpreted that sentence. The sentence that says, those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest also may fear. Some, all commentators agree that that refers to elders, pastors. Okay, so that if there's an elder or a pastor who is in sin of this kind, right? I'm not talking about an elder. Every sin that an elder does, we got to, you know, here's the list of the elder sins from this week. Uh, you know, Dave, uh, Pastor David uh, flipped off a car that, that cut him off. and it, That didn't happen this week. I didn't, I don't, that's not my thing. Yeah, that was last week. So <laughs> if you didn't get the newsletter, no. One of you is like, no, I saw you. No, I did not. I did not. That's not my thing. But we don't do that, right? But when an elder is caught in real massive sin, that is something that we, that we are responsible to speak about in front of the church. And as I told you last week, I've failed in this before. We've had pastors and or elders who have um, sinned in ways that should have been brought in front of the church. And I was not um, understanding this area of teaching well enough to have done it. Um, the fact is, is that at this point, now having greater understanding of these as we've studied it together, if an elder or pastor was to be in these kinds of lifestyle sins, you would hear about it. 
And one of the reasons that you would hear about it is because it should make you, it should make other elders and leaders fear to not be like that. Fear in the sense that they, uh, that they honor and have awe for God who will, who will have holiness in his church. There are some commentators who believe that refers to both elders and everybody in the congregation. And here's what I would say. As far as it, the Matthew 18 part where Jesus says, eventually you tell it to the church, I think it does apply. The difference between an elder and a person in the church is an elder doesn't get to have all of the steps on the way. If an elder is in the kind of sin that's disqualifying, that they're disqualified by, it, it's going to be in front of the church, right? If, they, if they're an elder, they're calling themselves an elder, and they're remaining an elder, then they're going to have to have that, have that happen, right? Um, and so in, in most cases, there are, there are situations where somebody's repentant and the thing doesn't need to go out. In fact, most sin is that way. But there are certain sins where rebuking in the presence of all is the right way to do it. And Paul, in fact, rebukes Peter uh, in front of everybody because Peter had been eating with the Gentiles and been showing Christian freedom, and then some Jews showed up. And then all of a sudden, Peter won't eat with the Gentiles. He'll only eat with the Jews. They're separating themselves. And Paul calls him out. It's like, you hypocrite, in front of everybody. Rebukes him in front of everybody, which is, would have been rough. Um, but that, there, is, there is a time where elders are treated differently. Um, what to do if a person is not willing to follow discipline, but others in the church still fellowship with them? So we, we talked about how the scripture is very clear that any kind of intimacy of relationship with a person who has been removed from the church for discipline reasons is inappropriate. That doesn't mean you can't say hi to them. You see them in the grocery store and you run the other way. Unclean, unclean. Um, that's, that's not what we're saying. You would show love and, and affection and attention the way that you would to anybody, which is to say you treat them like an unbeliever, right? But what you do not do is allow them to be under the impression that you consider them to be a Christ follower in good standing. You cannot treat them like a brother or like a sister. When, when, I, when I see you guys, and we're believers, actually, when you mean a believer anywhere, all around the world, and they go, yeah, I'm a Christ follower. It's like, ah, there's an instant connection, right? It's like a real thing. You, you don't get that anymore with that person. So while you can say hi in the restaurant, you cannot go out and have dinner like you're just regularly Christ follower. says, don't even eat with such a person. So if you're doing that, and you know that person is under church discipline, yeah, that would be, then you would be violating the scripture. Something to think about. Uh, does, the church, does the church recognize, how much time do I have left? 11.52? Not much. Does the church recognize a marriage as true and blessed union if it is not accompanied by a state-issued marriage license? What constitutes a marriage biblically? Great question. Um, so in the beginning, the state of Washington issued, no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> the way that we do marriage nowadays does involve, um, the state. And the only reason it involves the state, and I really don't think the state needs to be involved in a marriage or should be involved, frankly, but the reason it involves the state is for all kinds of things like the way we pay taxes and recognizing that people are married for the sake of their children and going to school, all kinds of stuff like that, right? The marriage license is not the thing. The thing is the marriage, the commitment for life. The reason that I would say I would not look the same on a marriage that did not have a marriage license is because that marriage license in our society is protecting your spouse, because if you don't have a marriage license and you just say, we're married, guess what you don't get to do? When the husband runs off with somebody else and takes all the stuff, the wife has no rights because she's not a wife under the law. And so even, even at this time, in the scriptures, in their legal system, they would have recognized marriage and the rights of a husband and a wife within marriage. Without that, the only rights you would have in the, or would be within the church. So if the church was perfect... And you said, I want to get married. David, I want you to do our marriage ceremony. We're going to be married, and we're under, we're under the church. So whatever happens in the future, if, we try, if I try to leave her, she tries to leave me or whatever, we're going to let the church adjudicate that. Fine. But guess what's going to happen? When the person wants to leave, and we say, you ought not to be leaving for that reason, or we, we say that since you're leaving, you need to give this much of, of your stuff to this person, they're going to go, no, I don't think so. And then what? 
Now you've left this person without what they're supposed to get. So the reason that we do the state marriage license isn't because we think the state is holy or good. The reason we do the state marriage license is because it's an act of affection for your spouse to have the protections of marriage and to those outside. To those outside. When you go, yeah, this is my uh, husband or this is my wife, and they go, but you're not, you never, you're not married legally. And they go, and you go, oh, it's a spiritual marriage. And they go, I thought you guys in the Bible, you weren't supposed to live with each other. Like, no, it really is a marriage. And they're like, well, but I, you know what I'm saying? To be above reproach. So now, am I saying that if you get married, which I've never known anyone to do this, but if you truly went through the process of getting married as, as Christ followers and there was no state involved, would it not be a marriage? I mean, if, the, if, if you do it by, in front of the Lord and it's, and it's blessed in front of the Lord, yeah, it would be a marriage. We all lived on a desert island all of a sudden. We just have to create all these laws, right? So there's nothing special about uh, the, the marriage license thing. But I would say, here's my, here's my strong recommendation as your pastor and brother in Christ. Don't do that. Don't say we're going to get married and we're not going to get a, a marriage license. I don't know any reason why you would do that. Um, and unless, unless you know that you guys will stay subject to the church for the rest of your life, and you can trust that you and your spouse will do that, then either you are putting yourself at risk or you're putting your spouse at risk. And I don't think that's wise. All right, it's, I got four minutes. Let me see if there's one that's really short. This one says, I have a lot of trouble forgiving myself. I know I don't deserve grace and can't, I can't earn it, but I can't help but be so harsh to myself constantly. Let me, let me help you out. This is great. 1 John 1, 9 says that if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is true, and if you have done that, you are forgiven, and there is no shame, and there is no guilt, and there is no nothing, and you need not be hard on yourself. And that's the truth. And so every time that you're hard on yourself, tell yourself the truth. Keep coming back to the truth. The scripture says, take every thought captive, right? We take thoughts captive unto Christ. Satan will try to make you feel shame. He will, have, he, will, he, will, he will put things in front of you that will try to remind you of your past, that try to bring you back down into that place. But Christ has said, you, in me, you are forgiven, you are free, you're clean. That's the end of the conversation. And so if you are struggling with that, let me just tell you, keep going back to that. Have 1 John 1, 9 on a, on a card and just read it says he's forgiven me from all over. He's cleansed me. He's cleansed me. He's cleansed me. If you're clean, you're clean. If you're clean, you're clean. You are, you, you're not going to be made dirty again because somebody else comes to you and says, remember when you did that thing? Be like, yeah, but God doesn't. Because he's separated as far as east is from west, and I'm not subject to you. I'm subject to him, and his son already paid for it on the cross. And I know the cost of that and value it and love him for it, and that's why I praise him. That's why I live for him. But it's gone, brother. That shame is gone. None of you should be living in shame. Do not live in shame. Christ has set us free. We are free in him. Mm-hmm.